All right, everyone, so we're going to get started now. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for coming out today. My name is Charles Frank. I'm the VP of the Sports and Entertainment Law Society. We have a great group of speakers here today. And on behalf of WCL, we cannot thank the panelists enough for taking the time out of their days to be here. And we are so fortunate that our moderator for, today, for today's panel is Professor Carroll. Professor Carroll is a professor here at WCL and the director of PIGIP, the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property. He's a graduate of Georgetown Law and the University of Chicago, and he also taught at Villanova Law School prior to joining the WCL faculty. He's clerked at the DDC and the DC Circuit. He spent some time in private practice at Wilmer, Cutler, and Pickering, and he now teaches and writes about IP and cyber law and has done extensive research on the history of copyright law and music. He's a founding member of the Creative Commons, and he serves on the board of the Public Library of Science and recently completed service on the National Research Council's Board on Research Data and Information. He's a member of the editorial board of IS Journal of Law and Policy for the Information Society. And finally, he's a non-resident fellow at the Center for Democracy and Technology and a member of the Advisory Board of Public Knowledge. Our first panelist seated second from my right is Brad Prendergast. He's the Senior Counsel of Licensing Enforcement at Sound Exchange. He's a graduate of Notre Dame where he served as Editor-in-Chief of the school's newspaper and at UVA Law. He was editor-in-chief of the Virginia Journal of Law and Technology. Prior to joining Sound Exchange, he was an associate at Sutherland, Asbill, and Brennan, where he focused on copyright and trademark. And Sound Exchange, where he, work, is an, where he works, is a nonprofit entity. It's designated by the Copyright Office to administer statutory license royalties pursuant to sections 112 and 114 of the Copyright Act, um, which deal with the digital audio transmission of sound recordings. And at Sound Exchange, he helps digital music services fulfill their obligations under, that, under those laws, and he handles regulatory and legal issues related to Sound Exchange's daily collection and distribution operations. Our next panelist, seated to my right, is Casey Ray from the Future Music Coalition. He's a musician, recording engineer, educator, journalist, media pundit, and adjunct professor at Georgetown University. He speaks regularly at conferences, universities, and in the media. He was actually at our school last week as well, so he's making an encore today. Um, and he speaks on new business models for artists, telecommunications policy, and also IP policy. He routinely works alongside leaders in the music, arts, and performance sectors to bolster an understanding of and an engagement in key policy and technology issues. He's written dozens of articles on the impact of technology on the creative community, and he serves on the board of directors of the Media and Democracy Coalition and also the National Alliance for Media, Arts, and Culture. And last but not least, our third and final panelist, seated third from my right, is John Simpson. He's an executive in residence here at American University and the Business and Entertainment Program Director at the Kogod School of Business here at American University. He's a former entertainment law at W. Sorry, he's a former entertainment law professor at WCL. He's also a special consultant for artist relations and business development at Cobalt Music Publishing, and he's of counsel to the firm Loman Abdo. And has been, he's also been in the music industry since 1971 as a recording artist and a songwriter. You can find his songs on Spotify, I believe. No. Uh, he's managed five times. Don't Grammy. bother. He's managed five-time Grammy Award winner Mary Chapin Carpenter and was a special advisor to Harry Belafonte for music and, and television projects. He's had a 30-year career as an entertainment lawyer advising clients on copyright and business issues in film, television, music, and the performing, or sorry, and the visual arts. His most recently, he's most recently served as executive director of Sound Exchange, where Brad works, for almost 10 years, which he helped launch in 2001. He's received an Emmy nomination for his music supervision of the May I Add fantastic PBS series, American Roots Music, and was named the Outstanding Volunteer Lawyer by the Washington Area Lawyers for the Arts. He's been featured on NBC, CNN, BBC, among many other news outlets, and he currently serves as chairman of the board of the National Recording Preservation Board of the Library of Congress, and as a board member of CINE, CINE, and as a board member of the Music Managers Forum. And last but not least, he's an alumnus of Nashville's leadership uh, music program and currently president of the Washington, D.C. chapter of the Grammy organization. So those are our speakers. And without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Professor Carroll. Let's give a round of applause for our panelists. Great. Um, so uh, th this is an extremely uh, uh, timely topic, and, and I want a, a tiny bit of background to frame our discussion because I, I certainly 
see some 1Ls in the audience uh, who uh, had contracts with me, so I'm going to assume that not everyone is familiar with the legal structure that, that kind of um, structures the music industry. So copyright law is one of the areas of law that is, is uh, deeply uh, ingrained in the way the music industry looks today. So if you are a young musician entering the space, um, here's what copyright law would tell you about kind of what the, the rules of the road are. Um, copyright arises when you create a, a musical work or a sound recording. Um, the law imagines that the creation of music has these two stages. Uh, this is already an outdated form, but the, the old idea was that there was a songwriter st stage in which the lyrics and the music were written down, and then that music would get recorded in a second stage, and copyright attaches to both of those stages. So the music, whoever writes the lyrics and music, they get a they get a copyright in what's called the musical work. So when you hear the words musical work in our discussion, we're talking about the songwriters. Then the performers and the producers and the sound engineers take that copyrighted work and they render it into a recording and they make a series of creative decisions about how it's going to sound. And that bundle of creative decisions gets captured in a second copyright called the sound recording copyright. Now, the, the, uh, we'll hear more from our industry experts about where those, who owns those rights and, and how, the, how they end up. But in general, from the political perspective, think about record companies as representing the sound recording and mu music publishers, who are often owned by record companies, <laughs> as representing, uh, and songwriters as representing the musical work copyright. Um, so that's, that's the set of rights that you get. Making money off of those rights depends on an industry where those rights are enforceable. And what makes copyright in music a complicated uh, area is that you've got lots and lots of different copyright owners and lots and lots of different copyrights. And then you've got radio, television, other kinds of services that need access to large bundles of copyrights in order to perform their service. So the music industry has responded to that going back to the early 20th century by uh, certain kinds of collective action. So if you've heard the terms ASCAP, BMI, uh, those refer to collections of the musical work copyrights that, for which you can get blanket licenses. So a radio station just needs to deal with essentially three organizations to get access to the permissions to, to broadcast their music. Um, the law is very complicated. There's one set of rules for over-the-air analog radio. There's another set of rules that deals with streaming audio because Congress changed the rules and said, when you stream the music, you pay two licenses, not one. You don't just pay the songwriter. You also pay the sound recording uh, copyright owner. And Brad's going to tell us more about that because that's the heart and soul of, of the business that, that they're in is collecting for streaming music. So um, the other piece that makes this really complicated, and then I'm going to open it up to our panelists, is that we're in a global marketplace. But copyright, like all other law, is territorial. And so traditionally, cross-border licensing involved sort of giving rights in a particular territory to collect money for the use of the music. Um, Europe is in the middle of this hand-wringing phase where there are 27 different countries where you, that means there are 27 different sets of copyrights that are administered by 27 plus different collective rights organizations. And so if you want to create a streaming service and get access to all those copyrights, you have to have lots and lots of negotiations and anyone can hold out. Um, and so this is why streaming radio has been, it's taken a while, but now we've got Spotify and Slacker and other kinds of services coming online. Uh, but just understand that the legal requirements for them to get access to the, the material is not easy. And in some cases, com music companies don't always know who owns the rights, and so they don't know whether they have the right to give the license, and that's actually been holding up some of the access. So young musicians entering this complicated world have to figure out where they're going to where, where they're going to fit. Do I want to sign with a major label? Do I want to go it on my own? If I go it on my own, what kind of licensing deals should I be making? Um, and so with that sort of basic um, framework, let me just ask uh, each of you to add a little bit more flavor. That's the sort of bones. But now make it real in terms of the business considerations that have, have go into 
how creative people make these decisions about where to fit themselves and what the new opportunities are and what the new challenges are. So why don't we just go straight down the table? Well, I would say that for new artists, uh, the DIY movement or do-it-yourself movement has certainly uh, taken on greater um, importance because, frankly, the kind of investment that major labels used to make in artists is no longer there. Um, you're either fully formed and have a hit single ready for these companies. And, and let me say that sometimes the major labels will find uh, a diamond in the rough and polish it for several years. You, you can go back to Alicia Keys, who got signed by Clive Davis at a very early age, and he worked with her for many years and then finally put out records. And that's not uncommon in Nashville with country artists, uh, where there'll be a lot of artist development. Um, Mary Chapin Carpenter, the artist that I managed, her first album came out on Columbia Records before they were bought by Sony, um, and it sold 15,000 copies. In today's marketplace, she would have been dropped immediately. But because of the different time, we got um, artist development and a second album, which had hit singles and sold a lot of copies and launched her career. And if you look at any of the major singer-songwriters of that, uh, actually even going further back. Bruce Springsteen's first album was a total failure commercially. Uh, his second album was marginally successful even though it was probably his best record. It was his third album that had Born to Run and became a huge hit. So artist development is a really critical piece. These days artists typically have to have a million hits on YouTube. You know, that's what major record companies are now responding to. And if you've already created a million hits on YouTube, do you really need a major label? We've seen things like Mac Lamar, you know, and, and uh, g Easy, and a, a number of other artists who are coming along and basically doing this without a major label. Um, so I think that's one of the first questions any young artist, you know, has to uh, answer to. I will say that, you know, you don't sell millions of copies without major labels distributing you. You may be able to own your own masters, you may be able to control more of the rights, but you need them to get you into certain distribution um, areas. So typically, uh, an artist like Drake, for example, you know, may have done it all on his, on his own, but then he signed a distribution deal with Universal Music. So again, very different universe than when I was signed as an artist. In fact, you couldn't put out your own vinyl back in the 19, early 1970s. You had to get signed by a record company. The technology just wasn't there. Um, we've progressed. And so it's easier for artists to make their recordings, cheaper. Um, that's a good thing and a bad thing. All you have to do is go on all SoundCloud and you'll figure that out, you know, that there's plenty of people making records who shouldn't be. But, um, uh, you know, and then, Another trend that, you know, I think has also been kind of an interesting one is the American idolization, or I could say the voiceization. No, I, you know, these singing competitions, it's reality television, they like good stories. Do they really find, they're going to find the next Bob Dylan on The Voice? Don't think so. Um, well, John talked about the, uh, the uh, perspective of the artist, of, of the music creation and distribution. I'll talk a little bit about music consumption. Um, at Sound Exchange, I, I work with the, uh, the webcasting services that stream the very content that, uh, that John's talking about, creation and distribution. Um, and what we're seeing, of course, is that over time, we've all moved from a model of, of owning music to a model of accessing own, uh, music. Um, we're more and more relying on streaming services as the source of our uh, of the of the music that we listen to, less so to uh, to, to owning anything. We don't, we don't own CDs anymore. Even with downloads, download sales for the first time in 2013 went down from the previous year. So we're really moving toward a model of access. And to give you some examples of how that access model has grown over the last 10 years or so, um, in 2005, when, when John was at Sound Exchange, uh, Sound Exchange distributed $20 million in royalties to uh, copyright owners and to performing artists. Um, you know, in 2013, we distributed $590 million. That's an increase of almost 30 times. Um, and so that, and that is just for um, the the streaming services that operate under the statutory license that we administer. And that statutory license has a series of limitations that are designed to be um, so that the, those services are only those that are uh, more like traditional radio as opposed to on demand. Um, and so when I say that there's, you know, that Sound Exchange distributed $590 million in royalties last year. Um, that's not, that, that's only part of the pie. There's a lot of on-demand royalties that come in too. Um, and so we're, we're seeing a huge shift there. Has that shift replaced what the record labels and the artists made in, in, in terms of uh, uh, revenues from sales? No, it, it hasn't. It's been, it, the market has, has 
in the recording industry has has, has shrunk pretty dramatically. Um, and uh, and so while we might be talking about big numbers, we do need to bear in mind that that hasn't replaced what record labels and what uh, performing artists received in revenues um, in the past. Um, ways that we can address that, we'll talk about that, I'm sure, later, but um, there, there are uh, um, a series of legislative changes that are um, under consideration um, that will address how these webcasting services um, pay royalties, how over-the-air uh, uh, radio will, might, might pay royalties. Um, so we're, we're definitely in, a, in, a, in a, uh, a period of massive flux when it comes to, to how music is, is consumed and then how, therefore, uh, people are compensated for that consumption. If I could just jump in real quick, um, there was just a report out, um, streaming music subscriptions, uh, and I've always been concerned that people won't pay on a monthly basis, but last year they went from 3.4 million to 6.1 million from 2012 to 2013, which was actually subscribers? remarkable. Subscribers? Yeah, subscribers. Yeah. Um, so people actually paying on a monthly basis went from 3.4 to 6.1. Subscription uh, streaming revenue went up 57 percent last year as well over all uh, streaming services, including the on-demand. Um, and this was an IFPI report um, that recently came out. The International Federation of Phonographic Industries. Essentially, if you know the RIAA in the United States, they're sort of the equivalent worldwide, representing all of the uh, record companies around the world. So. R really, really strong numbers on the streaming side. So uh, <clears throat> you may be familiar with the old Chinese proverb, may you live in interesting times. Uh, it's kind of like also a curse. I think we are actually in these interesting times. There's a tremendous amount in flux uh, in terms of both how policymakers are looking at this space. And also there's uh, you know some, still some rumblings in the courts and how they uh, – react to existing statute and its effect on the music community. I wanted to zero in on a couple of distinctions that Brad outlined because I think they're super important. If we do <clears throat> want to accept as a premise that we're moving to a, an access model, I believe that we are. I think that uh, consumer expectation is being shaped not just by Spotify and Pandora, but by Netflix, the idea that you don't have to own a collection of DVDs anymore. Now, in music, it's really very interesting because you have some services like Pandora that are eligible for a statutory license which on the master use side which means that they can pretty much uh, they they can play whatever they want any of the sound recordings that they want provided that they compensate the performers and song uh, excuse me performers and labels and that royalty is collected and distributed by sound exchange uh, you know that that looks completely different for an on-demand service like Spotify where you as the listener can choose the song that you listen to this is deemed an interactive service so the negotiations uh, to obtain that catalog happen on a one-to-one -one basis between the rights holder and the service so that's a for the master use that's entirely different uh, those two categories and then you can look at the composition side you know the publishing side of the copyright because there are two copyrights in music and you have the mechanical royalty that is a percentage of of, uh, of revenue I believe somewhat arcane how they arrive at it uh, that's paid to publishers and songwriters for uh, through the Harry Fox agency for interactive services and of course on the non-interactive radio-like services, you have a royalty that's paid by the traditional performing rights organizations, ASCAP, CSAC, and BMI. Now that I've complicated everything <laughs> to such an extent, I will tell you that I think the dynamics break down into a few core points. And one is uh, that we're experiencing a lot in, in the recent agitation and heartburn around uh, webcasting rates is one of leverage, parity, and artist compensation. So leverage in some instances means if you are a major publisher, for example, you might believe that your leverage is closely related to your ability to take your toys and go home. That is your negotiation. Right now, under the consent decrees and recent judicial opinion about them, that seems to not be the case. You're either all in or all out, the, the decisions. Two slightly different decisions, but they kind of affirm one another. You're all in or all out. And leverage for an artist, my, a songwriter, might look totally different because as a songwriter, you may uh, look to your PRO, you, uh, ASCAP, or CSAC or BMI as your leverage because they are negotiating on your behalf independently of your publisher, and that's a very important thing. And the parity issue is really huge because you look at this space, some people still don't pay for the use of music. For example, terrestrial radio, still the biggest footprint in, in broadcasting or, or radio, 
uh, does not compensate performers and sound copyright owners. And this is something that has kind of complicated the marketplace as we're looking for ways to um, construct appropriate rate setting processes that take in the right kind of evidence to make the right kind of determinations to make sure the right people are paid uh, regularly and, and transparently. And so that, that's a mess. Uh, Congress is looking not just at any one of these things now. They've kicked off a, a, a rolling inquiry, a rambunctious and rolling inquiry on the Hill in the House subcommittee, um, and that's ongoing. The Copyright Office has just last week uh, announced uh, opening a uh, public inquiry into music licensing writ large. And of course, you still have uh, various folks like the USPTO and, the, and, and other people talking about specific aspects of music licensing, including what we talked about last week, which was the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. So I'll stop there, but I, I think that what we're trying to see is, what we're, what we're getting to is a sense that we have to have a better, more efficient system to grow the marketplace, but the legitimate digital marketplace. But while we're doing so, we have to be very intentional and thoughtful about what the compensation structures are and how the artists themselves are, are rewarded within them. Uh, to add another layer of intrigue, um, so I was managing artists back in 1995 when we lobbied to get the Digital Performance Right and Sound Recordings Act passed, which gave the first performance right. Um, in, in U.S. history so that recording artists and their record companies would actually get paid for streaming music over internet, satellite, anything digital, non-interactive. Um, but it gave rights to the record companies for interactive streams as well. The thing that was really interesting, we actually went to get rights from radio as had been done for the last, well, it's now 90 years. We started in the 1920s. Not me personally. Uh, um, I was still a child. Then. No, no, just kidding. Um, so in the, you know, the record industry has tried since the 1920s uh, to get rights uh, to get paid by broadcasters. Um, and there have been a number of campaigns. It's a really fascinating history if any of you are interested in it. Um, and we really, really came close in 2010, my last year at Sound Exchange. I thought my going away present to my constituents was going to be a radio uh, performance right at terrestrial radio. Negotiations got to the point where the National Association of Broadcasters actually endorsed a deal. This had never happened in the history of the industry before. Now, it was only 1% of their revenue, but it was still, uh, you know, a foot in the door. Uh, their revenue, by the way, is about $17 billion a year. So 1% was $170 million. It was nothing to sneeze at. Um, so we used to always say, and it, this battle, by the way, that we had from the 1920s uh, through today had one interesting and, and major uh, casualty. And that is that sound recordings in the United States have never had a copyright or didn't have a copyright until February 15th of 1972. Now, imagine, you know, my chagrin. My album came out November 15th of 1971. <laughs> so if I'd only thought, you know, with a little bit more hindsight, I would have asked my record company to delay it three months. Should have procrastinated longer. I know. I should have. I should have. I, I got that one mix done and it was <laughs> over. But anyway, so no copyright until February 15th of 72. So we have this very interesting situation in the United States that s recordings released before February 15th of 1972 are not protected under copyright law, federal copyright law. They may be protected under common law copyrights or state uh, copyright law. Um, and in fact, the federal, you know, the Copyright Act actually says that they're protected under state and common law until 2067 mm -hmm. when they all go on into the public domain. Now, that means theoretically you could have a 1922 recording that is protected until 2067, um, you know, subject to a court telling you, you that you don't. But so the problem that you have, we used to always say, you know, radio stations didn't pay performers so that when you heard Aretha Franklin singing Respect, she wasn't getting paid by over-the-air radio. But Otis Redding's estate was because Otis Redding wrote the song, Respect. Um, or when Aretha was singing Natural Woman, she wasn't getting paid, but Carol King, who wrote the song, was. But now we have a situation where not only, and then we would say, but when it's being played on webcasting services like Pandora and Sirius XM Satellite Radio, Aretha's getting paid and Carol King's getting paid. Aretha's getting paid and the estate of Otis Redding. But that's not true anymore because the songwriter's still getting paid, the artists who have pre-72 recordings are now not being paid because it's not covered under federal law. 
So we've now seen a number of lawsuits that have been filed in the last six months about whether or not uh, pre-72 recordings are going to be covered under state or common law copyright. The major labels have filed against Sirius XM on behalf of their vast catalogs of, you think about the Motown catalog or the Beatles catalog. I mean, these are incredibly valuable catalogs. Um, they've filed in the state of California, a state law complaint. Um, the Turtles, a band from the 60s, um, you might remember Happy Together or Ellen or G, I think you're swell. Um, I'm not sure it's intellectual property, but it's property. Um, I usually reserve that comment for Justin Bieber. But, hey, Flo um, and Eddie are awesome. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> I know I love the Turtles. Uh, but Flo and Eddie, who are the two great. leaders of the Turtles, have filed uh, class action lawsuits in New York, California, and Florida. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see uh, X, Sirius XM made a motion to consolidate. I think that was denied yeah. um, because there are different state law claims uh, in different states. John, can I add a, one wrinkle to that that's actually very interesting on the pre-72 uh, case? Uh, if uh, pre-72 copyrights are federalized, and that will mean that there's another part of the law that applies to them, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and the notice and takedown requirements. So uh, some of this could be strict. I don't it's way above my pay grade, but some of this might be strategic thinking on, on behalf of the labels uh, to not go to federalization because they want to perhaps hold other entities accountable uh, or liable for certain uses. Yeah, and, and, and it, it, this is a perfect example of the shifting dynamics and alliances in this whole space among webcasters, broadcasters, uh, labels, publishers. Um, it, the, there are, to your point, there are webcasters, smaller webcasters, not necessarily Pandora or SiriusXM, that would prefer to see uh, sound recordings federalized, pre-72 sound recordings. It makes it easy. It makes it easy to license. Right now, the, um, the, the services, um, Pandora, for example, does not pay under the statutory license for pre-72 recordings, neither does SiriusXM. A lot of webcasting services choose to pay sound exchange for every track they play, and they don't pay attention to whether or not it's pre-72 or or post-71, and they would like certainty. They would like certainty in knowing that they are covered for their transmissions. And right now, that's an open question. Another interesting thing about federalization, and, and at least as the opportunity plays out on uh, uh, non-interactive services, is the way that the, that license is structured is... I think one of the, the, the greatest advancements in artist royalties in the history of artist royalties. The money is paid directly to the performing artist uh, by sound exchange, separately from the label's half. And that means that it's not held against their debt to the label. It doesn't go into any crazy accounting land. Uh, and, and even more importantly, if you're signed to a label, that, fair, that, that split is inherently fair. Uh, the performing artist or the featured artist gets 45% with 5% reserved for uh, the unions for backup singers and background performers. So when we're thinking about, you know, uh, how to, to, to create a digital music industry that works for everybody, we have to not just look at how much is being paid, but how the compensation is structured. And to, to me, when, we're, when people toss around words like compulsory license, that just means that you have to pay. If you're going to use music commercially, you should pay for music. And I think that's something that at least everybody on this panel would agree to. The other question is, how do you structure that so that artist compensation is baked into the cake? Uh, you could do it in statute. Uh, for songwriters, it's reflected in the consent decrees. Yeah, just one thing to mention about what Casey just said. Um, when I first read the statute, again, I was, I was a manager, managing artist, but I was a lawyer. But here I am lobbying for this bill. The bill gets passed, and then five years go by, and someone recruits me to, to actually help launch this. I start reading the bill, and the bill says that the collecting society will collect the money, pay 5% to the unions after an F of M for the non-featured, the background singers, the background vocalists, send 95% to the copyright owner who will allocate 45% to the featured performer. My head almost exploded. Because that's not what I had lobbied for on behalf of artists. I had lobbied for artists to get direct pay. And so it was very, it, I looked at allocate and I said allocate means they can recoup against this money. And you know, as you know, the, the major labels are typically the bank and they're advancing money to do videos and advancing monies for you to make records. And then they recoup everything back and it's hard for you to see any money. And I thought this is day to day living money. It's not going to happen that way. So the law was actually changed in 2003. I got the major labels to agree to do this on an experimental basis in 2001 and 2 to pay directly to the artists because it was like what ASCAP and BMI do. I said, if you want legitimacy, if you want the mm -hmm. artist community 
to back you. You need to do this. And so they did on an experimental basis. We had an opportunity to change the law in 2003 with the help of some Future of Music Coalition people, frankly, uh, and others on my board, uh, and we got that done. So. Yeah. And so that's John's I, I need to jump in. There. There's a little translation that's needed here, uh, a lot of inside baseball. So what you're hearing is about the way in which copyright law operates, treats music differently because of the features of many copyrights, many copyright owners, and the need to consolidate. So the, the basic theory of copyright is we create property-like rights, the rights to exclude others. When you have those rights, then it means someone else who wants to make use of your property has to negotiate with you over the term. So that system works well. If you're J.K. Rowling, you've written a, a series of copyrighted works. Warner Brothers wants to make a movie. They know who to negotiate with. It's one negotiation or one set of negotiations, one set of licenses. And that's the whole idea of exclusive rights in intellectual property, is that the parties will decide what the terms are. The parties will decide what the price of the license is based on their valuation and their leverage. What we're hearing is that in the music industry, that relying on one-on-one -on -one negotiations when so many different licenses are required, would, would the cost of transacting would be so large that it would actually get in the way of creating the ability to operate in these, in these um, ways. So the ASCAP and BMI were voluntary collective societies. That is, the copyright owners got together and pooled their copyrights so that radio stations could get the access. Those, but the government got involved. What's funny is different parts of the government get involved. In that case, that voluntary cooperation led to licensing practices that were uh, alleged to be anti-competitive, that the, there was so much market power in that bundle that you really had no choice. You could take, it was take it or leave it. So uh, they were sued for antitrust violations and since 1946, 41. 41, ASCAP and BMI have been under the jurisdiction of a federal district court in Manhattan. So this is a case that was filed in the 40s that is still considered an active part of the U.S. district court's docket. And every time they want to change their rates, they have to go to a judge and have a hearing and get permission. So it's kind of an administrative, the judge is almost acting like an administrative agency. Um, and we're currently having an issue about whether particularly uh, valuable artists can pull their rights out of that and, and license them separately. So there's a, a challenge now. And, but otherwise, it was all, all in one with a judge sort of making sure the terms of those were fair and reasonable. So price was somewhat voluntarily set, but with a government overlay on the price. The other piece is what we're hearing about these statutory licenses. So, so what uh, Brad deals with is when the, when the move from terrestrial radio to online radio happened, instead of just saying each right, now that uh, record companies have the right to charge, but we're going to give radio stations the ability to automatically have permission to stream any record they want as long as they pay, play by the rules and pay the rate. So play by the rules is why when you go to Pandora and you say, I really want to hear this song, and you can't hear it. Why not? Because the theory was that would be an interactive service, in which case you're substituting for purchasing the music. And if you want to substitute for the purchase, you need a negotiated license. But if you're really more like the DJ decides what you're going to hear, a non-interactive service, then you'll get an automatic right to stream records, uh, uh, records, but now you have to pay the record company. And what we were just hearing is that the legislation about that license has in it this interesting feature where who gets paid is in the statute, and it says the artist gets paid directly. The reason that matters is because in the, in, in the way a record deal works, you often sign, in the old days, you would sign a three, five, seven record deal. If the first record made no money, like Bruce Springsteen's first record, the record company would basically hold you in debt for that, so that even if you made a lot of money on your second album as an artist, you don't get to see a cent until all the debts from the first album are paid off. And that's what it means to recoup. Get, I want to guess, how many, how many records in, in, in the old days, how many records w made enough money that the artists actually started to see money on the record sales? What percentage? 
That's why they used to tell you to be in publishing and songwriting because there were more ways to exploit the copyright. For for example, terrestrial radio actually paid you right. if you were the songwriter. But, but what percentage? What do you? Yeah. How about less than one percent? Right. How about 0.03 percent of the records were making 80 percent of the industry's revenue? Right. It is a real winner takes all kind of marketplace. And so the ability for artists to get directly paid every time their music is played gets them out of the recoupment trap that they were in under these record deals. And that's been a seismic shift in, in the industry. Could I just uh, offer a quick counter narrative? I mean, uh, you know, not to demonize the record labels entirely. I mean, the, the it's a long and tortured history of like creative accounting. And you've probably heard the horror stories. But yeah, I think somebody mentioned earlier that the labels, John, you said the labels essentially acted as a bank in the in the original version of the industry. And in some ways right now is what we're having is is an investment gap in the upfront um, you know, funding of of rec the recorded music product. Granted, some of the associated costs have fallen, uh the barriers to entry are lower, but you know, it still costs money to make a good recording. It really does. You need, you know, folks who have good ears, you know, folks uh, the, even the even the uh, software costs money, right? So it's not like it's free. Um, but the interesting thing is nowadays we have the opportunity to, to, as we're creating this new marketplace, one that might be predicated on access, to see if we can change the rules in a way that is more equitable to artists. This is a new turning point in, in history. Now, on an interactive service, you might hear some people, including independent labels, uh, some of them that I know, they, they would like a statutory or a collective license for interactive services to some extent because they know that they're getting paid the same as, as the majors and it's not, uh, you know, it's not weighted towards market share or something else. Not all of them believe that. I can't like paint with the same brush. Opinions vary. But uh, musicians might benefit from that environment as well because in, if you're signed, it, it means that your compensation isn't on like the you know page 666 of your 360 degree contract. What you get paid for a stream on Spotify, right? Um, the the idea would be that there would be a an organization or a PRO, a digital PRO, that would collect and distribute that money to you directly. But you know that's the kind of thing that sorry uh, that, that the copyright office will probably be uh, asking and looking at in its new inquiry and music license. You know, one of the things that I think is interesting that you pointed out is that you know there's a complexity. We, we have a compulsory license which allows everybody to use, really for one reason only. Um, back in 1995, when the law was being drafted, ASCAP and BMI, and in, and in 1995, CSAC was really tiny. Uh, CSAC which the acronym actually stands for the Society of European Symphonic Authors and Composers, which was started in 1933 to represent European composers who thought that ASCAP wasn't collecting fairly for them in the United States. But it was a, a very moribund organization. It was bought by some music industry insiders in 1993. They turned it into a for-profit and essentially have created this new society that kind of cherry picks. Um, and they're now about 5% of the marketplace, so still much smaller than ASCAP and BMI, but uh, an interesting player now. But they weren't a player in 1995. What ASCAP and BMI said to Congress, to the Judiciary Committee that was contemplating this legislation is, we're worried that if you give record companies a new right, they'll withhold the right. And so no one will get licensed and our members will lose money, our songwriters will lose money. So if you do give them this right, the right needs to be compulsory so that they have no right to say no. They can't withhold content. And so that is why we have a compulsory license under Section 114. Had nothing to do with the users, interestingly enough, which you might think a user would say, I want to be able to access, um, you know, catalog. Um, so, but you're right, the transaction costs for a Section 114 license, which is this compulsory license for the masters, is basically sending the Copyright Office a form with a $30 check now. It used to be 20 but I think it's $30. And 25. then you, what? 25 25 okay. <laughs> And then you pick a license that SoundExchange offers, uh, and, and you're good to go. You really, you know, and you look at Spotify, which is interactive, which is an exclusive right to whoever owns content. Mm -hmm. It took Spotify over two years to get all those licenses together in the United States, and they had to give away 20% of the equity mm -hmm. in their company to get those licenses from the three major companies. Well, it was four at the time, but the three major labels. So not only is there a huge cost in terms of transaction costs, and then think about Spotify as well. If you're Pandora and you have this compulsory license, you can play anything and you know no one can sue you because you have the absolute right to play any commercially released sound recording. If you're Spotify, you better have a contract with every single recording you play 
Because if you don't, you'll get sued by the owner of that recording. And we've seen those things happen, especially in the long tail. There are copyright trolls who do exploit this to the degree that they can, uh, and you have to be careful. Um, so interactive, much harder, obviously, the non-interactive. John, a couple thoughts on that. Yep. Uh, one is the, the, one of the reasons that the, the compulsory nature of the statutory license had nothing to do with the, the music services, the, the users, was because in 1995 there weren't any. Yeah. Well, <laughs> there were three. Yeah, there were none on the, on the uh, non-subscription side. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and the interesting thing, too, the irony of this is that the, um, the, as the publishers are pushing for this, uh, for this right to be compulsory, at the same time they also said that the, uh, the, the rates that would be um, set by whatever um, uh, arm of the Copyright Office or the Library of Congress, that those rates could not be used as evidence right. in rate-setting proceedings for the musical work, for the performance of the musical work. And of course, the, the fear that back then was that the uh, the rate, the royalty rates for this on the sound recording side would be so low that they would adversely impact the musical work royalty rate. And of course, things have, have mm -hmm. been 180 degrees different. And, and nowadays, the royalty rate on the sound recording side is, is many multiples of what it is on the, on the musical work side. So that's, that's a little bit of irony there. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and one other point related to what John said is, he's in terms of the discussion between um, interactive and, and non-interactive services, um, one, another trend, as we try to identify trends up here, another trend is, is, is how those two components, those two subsets, are converging toward each other. Um, ten years ago, Pandora would have been thought of as an interactive service. The idea behind the statute when it was written was that if, if, the, if, the, um, if, the, if the service created a program specially created for the user, then, and that's the language in the statute, statute then it would be considered interactive. Um, think about what you do when you use Pandora. And you, you type in a particular genre, a particular artist, a particular um, uh, a group, and it, and it returns a program specially created according to your parameters. But um, the, a seminal case in 2009 said, no, 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 that's not, that's not interactive. And the reason for that is, is twofold. One is the user did not have uh, predictability into what um, they were going to hear. In fact, when you're using Pandora and you want to hear a particular track, the absolute last thing you should do is enter the name of that particular track. Um, and, and the other thing uh, is, to, is to Professor's point, which is uh, substitution. Um, the judge in that, in that case determined that these, uh, the, 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 the LaunchCast service, which is a pr fairly identical to Pandora, um, was, uh, um, was, was not um, substituting for sales. And so it, it, within the spirit of the dichotomy between interactive and non-interactive, it fell on the line uh, of non-interactive. Right, but it's interesting now that we're, we're seeing outside of the growth of vinyl, you know, the, the continued depression of the physical sales marketplace. The distinction, I don't want to call it arbitrary in terms of what the user is allowed, but it feels arbitrary. The substitution argument certainly feels arbitrary because it's, you know, it's Spotify and, and on-demand services are also substituting for uh, a physical sale or even a download at this point. One other thing that's kind of interesting to me is, is that uh, you, you mentioned the fact that the, the publishers were uh, wanted uh, the evidence uh, for rate setting to be in admissible in setting the rates for compulsory. And a bill was just introduced, um, I don't know, maybe like three weeks ago, backed heavily by the publishers and, and the PROs came on too, uh, that would actually completely invert that, meaning that uh, they want now, they want the evidence used to set rates for the sound recording to be admissible in the proceedings, the rate negotiating uh, negotiations around the uh, uh, composition use. And that's, that's really interesting, and that cuts to the heart of what parity looks like under these evolving marketplace conditions. So, so let me ask about this. Two questions, and then uh, we want audience questions, so uh, you can go ahead and start lining up at the mic. But... Um, so one is the old story theory about why it was justified not to pay the record companies a, a, a license when they performed is that radio was effectively marketing and that, that you pay the songwriter, but the, that the radio play then leads to record sales. And therefore, and in fact, payola is a term you may have heard, right? Payola is when the recording company pays the radio to play their music. And under the FCC's rules, it's actually legal to do that. You just have to say that you just took money <laughs> to play this. But so one provocative question is, if record companies now get paid for over-the-air radio play, isn't that just asking for a discount on payola? Um, 
And, uh, you know, and, and what's happened is, uh, but the other one is, is about sort of music discovery more generally. That in the old days, radio was the way people discovered new music. Now we have lots of different ways. So that's one question. The other question is, in, in Washington, when policymakers hear about the music industry and the music industry has lost half of its value, that usually means, well, the number of employees working for the major labels has cut down the number of, but is that really a fair characterization of the music industry? If copyright is supposed to stimulate the progress of science and useful arts in general throughout the society, is it really right for policymakers just to be looking at the large companies involved in the industry as, as representing the amount of musical creativity in the society as a whole? So can I sort of take a questions. crack at the first one and then I'll give a one sentence answer to the second one. I'll be as brief as I can on both. Uh, the first question is about, you know, I think the, the value. So we're, I guess the only remaining question is what is the value of volition, right? You have the lean back experience, which is like passive radio listening. And we have to be honest with ourselves. For a huge chunk of the, of the consumer uh, populace, even in the analog days, listening to the radio was good enough. A lot of them weren't going to be motivated to go to the record store. Those who were were probably motivated by hearing it on the radio. And so that w there was, let's be honest, a promotional aspect for that. It could drive a certain segment of the, of the listening base to purchase a record. Nowadays, of course, we, the marketplace is a combination of volitional activity. So what's the value? How do you, how do you value the on-demand versus the lean back? So that's a huge question. The direct deals, I think you, you brought up a, a, an interesting idea there, uh, the payola thing. Right now, the, the major terrestrial radio uh, companies, including Clear Channel, are exploring the idea of compensating for over-the-air AM, FM plays, compensating the performers and labels <clears throat> in exchange for, I think, or, I, or the rumors are, lowered rates on the digital side because they all have simulcasts. And of course, those deals only apply to the labels or the individual bands that they've done those deals with, so it could be de facto payola. One thing that, that those deals do not get to is the lack of a reciprocal right globally, which means uh, American artists are not, to this day, unable to collect for overseas plays. These direct deals for terrestrial radio uh, between them and rights holders do nothing to alleviate that problem. So it's not a panacea by any means. Very, very quickly, if you look at uh, the relevant clause in the United States Constitution, you will not see any mention of, of, of rights holders. You will see mentions of securing for a limited time to the, uh, to the authors of their respective discoveries, but nothing about rights holders. So I think that it's absolutely appropriate, particularly as Congress is looking at uh, what this all means, what copyright law uh, means, to not lose sight of that Im implicit uh, uh, balance between the public good and rewarding authors. Uh, but I, let me take you guys back a few hundred dec years. No. Um, in the 1920s, there was a battle going on in the American home, and it was between wireless and the Victrola. Uh, wireless, of course, was radio. Um, and radio's first ads, imagine how many records you'd have to buy to hear all the music you can hear for free on this radio station. Radio was always a substitutional product. So they were basically saying to people, you don't have to buy records. And in fact, in the late 1920s, the record industry declined by two-thirds. And almost every record label went out of business. The two big record companies that were able to survive were Victor, which became RCA Victor, Radio Corporation of America, a radio company bought them to keep them in business, and Columbia Records, the Columbia Broadcasting Company, another major broadcaster bought another record company so that they would continue to have content. So let's not be, you know, mince words here. This is highly substitutional. When I was managing artists, we would do focus groups. And radio stations would tell us, oh, 5%, maybe 10% of our listeners are active. And what that meant was those are listeners who would go and enter contests. Those were listeners who wanted to be backstage to meet the artist at concerts who were buying tickets. 90% were there just to listen to the music instead of having to buy it. So I always used to say when we had these battles with radio, look, you can have the 10% that buy stuff for free. Pay me for the 90% who don't buy anything. And that was what I thought was fair. We've never had a terrestrial performance, right? You know, it, it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, you know, Casey mentioned these direct licenses that, you know, Clear Channel and Entercom have now entered with a number of, of record companies to pay them even though they don't have to. Um, but it, it is going to take a change in the copyright law um, so that we do get paid. Um, let me also, Casey glossed over something that's really critical for American recording artists. So 
The United States does not have a terrestrial performance right. But even more important than that, because we didn't want to take on lobbies, other lobbies, the restaurant lobby. You go into a restaurant, you're hearing Beyonce. You're hearing all sorts of people who are making you stay there longer, drinking more, right? Adding value. They wouldn't be playing the music if it didn't have value to them. Um, Restaurants pay nothing to the recording artists for the background music. Uh, it was mentioned in my bio, I've represented Harry Belafonte for many years. You go to any baseball stadium, any football stadium, any sporting event, and you will hear, Dale! you know, I mean, every time. He gets nothing for that, right? The person who wrote the song gets paid, but he gets nothing for that incredible performance of his. And it's just not fair, especially with sports teams who protect their trademarks and their intellectual property so vehemently. But they don't pay anything. So understand that huge amounts of money were left on the table. Just on radio alone, it was $9 billion that songwriters got paid between 1972 and 2005, um, if you go back to 72 when we first got our copyright. If you go back even further, it's obviously many, many more dollars that were left on the table because we didn't have a right. Here we have broadcasters saying to Congress, oh, well, we promote their records so we shouldn't have to pay. That would be like you know, me running a chicken restaurant and saying, I don't need to pay the farmer because I'm promoting chicken. I mean, no other business gets to say, I'm helping you, so I don't have to pay you when I use your stuff. So it's totally unfair. But what's even more unfair is every other major developed country has a performance right so that their performers get paid. There was a treaty signed in 1961 called the Rome Convention. We're not a signatory to it. All the other major territories are um, because we don't protect our performers' rights. Um, because of that, when Beyonce gets played in France, Beyonce's record company gets paid because it's Sony France. It's not Sony US, it's Sony France, a local company that gets to collect their half. Beyonce's half gets distributed into French cultural funds. Now there are some exceptions. If Beyonce recorded in Paris, she'd get her money. Um, in the UK, when you know they play Beyonce in the UK, Sony UK gets their share. Beyonce's money gets actually paid to her record company. She has no right to collect. So this re lack of re reciprocity because of the Rome Convention costs American artists somewhere between 100 and 150 million dollars a year. Let's talk about not Beyonce. There's a ton of uh, American artists who are not necessarily the songwriters. I'm thinking about the ja jazz genre, the R&B genre. Maybe terrestrial radio in the United States doesn't value uh, that American heritage heritage in the way that they should, but overseas, certainly a lot of uh, countries over the years have uh, been enormously enamored of, of this expression and continue to use it in terrestrial broadcasts. None of those artists, I think Beyonce is probably doing okay, but those artists are also unable to collect. But many of those artists have actually moved to those countries where they actually are <laughs> residents, so they do get paid, but that's a different issue. Yeah. I want to add two uh, points of implication to what um, John and, and Casey were just discussing. And um, One is on, on, on the topic of, of whether um, something a service is promotional or substitution, substitutional of music. Um, as John mentioned, it, uh, radio has always been uh, substitutional from the beginning. Um, the the longstanding uh, theory was that it was promotional, it, it, it drove record sales. Even if that were true back then, it cannot be true now. Um, we live in a in a market that is far too segmented. You can you can you, you don't turn to the radio. Uh, to, to listen to what you want to hear. You don't go to Tower Records to, to buy what you want to buy. You can find whatever it is you want to hear or anything that you might want to hear on, on the iTunes store, on, on Amazon, or through any of the 2,000 different streaming services that pay royalties to Sound Exchange. The bottom line is that these services are not, uh, and, and radio is not promoting anything anymore. It's, 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 it's substitutional to the highest degree. Um, and where this, where the rubber meets the road on this issue, not only with respect to the, the terrestrial um, performance right, it's, it's also in, in the rate settings that are used to determine what the royalty rates will be under the statutory license. And one of the factors that is always under consideration in those rate settings is, is whether a service is promotional or substitutional in the degree to which. And, um, and, and um, this is particular ti particularly timely, timely because the most recent uh, rate setting is just gearing up now. It started in January. Um, it's a two-year cycle that will culminate in December of 2015 when the, the three judges that sit on the Copyright Royalty Board issue their rate determination. And that will set the rates for 2016 through 2020. So this issue is particularly apt at this point in time. Um, and, and, and underlying it is, is a fundamental component of, of, of copyright, and that is the right to exclude. Um, and we, we, we've, been, we've been pointing at it in this, in this discussion, but sound recording copyright owners don't have, um, uh, have not always had the, the, um, 
the, the right to exclude. And even now, it's a, it's, um, with respect to the performance right, it's a limited right. It's limited only to, to digital audio transmissions. And, and you asked, um, the, the question came up about whether um, over the over royalties would be some sort of a discount on payola. I think it's important to remember that, um, that the, uh, the, that, uh, the that sound recording copyright owners don't have uh, a full copyright, as we understand. They don't have a full bundle of rights. Um, and so they, they've been handcuffed in their ability to make the arguments that um, that they that they should be paid for for the um, for the use of their works. I want to put that in a more concrete context. We talked briefly about the uh, um, the, the fact that Clear Channel and, and some other broadcasters are starting to quote pay for over-the-air transmissions. I would argue that they're not paying for over-the-air transmissions. Um, Casey alluded to the to the, the parameters of the of these deals, and I'll, I'll just summarize that just so we know what we're talking about. Basically, as Casey mentioned, Clear Channel is, has agreed to pay a percentage of its terrestrial revenue, um, along with presumably a discounted um, royalty rate on the uh, on the on the uh, online webcasting. Um, that doesn't necessarily that does not mean that Clear Channel is paying uh, royalties for its over-the-air transmissions. That you have to that it, it, what Clear Channel is doing is really just repackaging the calculation for the royalties that it owes on the digital side. So it is calculating the royalties that it owes on the digital side by basically adding two components together: the um, component for its digital re revenues and its component for the terrestrial revenues. But it doesn't mean that there is any terrestrial royalty. In fact, there can't be a terrestrial royalty because there isn't a terrestrial right. So let me join. All right, we talked about interactive, non-interactive. It's time to get interactive. Can we have some questions, please? In the meantime, I, I don't know how I have to listen to terrestrial radio when I drive in, and it's like, if there's not payola going, explain to me why. It's like, ooh, I haven't heard passengers let it go in like, what, five minutes? Oh, here it is. <laughs> well, it, 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 there's a public policy decision behind that, that that it doesn't have to do with copyright, but certainly has affected the copyright industries. In 1996, Congress passed the Telecommunications Act. It removed the number, it removed the caps on the number of stations a single broadcast entity could own. So previously, when I was growing up, for example, you could put me in the back seat and put a blindfold around me. Uh, this did not actually happen. No one ever did that. And drive me from... <laughs> Drive me from Portland, Maine to Portland, Oregon, and I could probably tell you, even at age eight or whatever, that, you know, where I was just by what was on the radio. You know, when you're in, in Nashville, to some extent you still do, obviously, but, you know, the idea is that there was a, a, an immense diversity of mom and pop commercial broadcasters that were breaking new acts and doing amazing things just because they had more autonomy. Now, the 96 Act kind of ushered in the era of Clear Channel, and they heavily demographically tested this in order to sell the most, you know, all of this was like, can we sell the the most uh, toothpaste to the most listeners, you know, during drive time. And they made deliberate choices to reduce and restrict the, the playlist to the point where they're basically like playing five songs on the radio. That's absolutely <laughs> well, but, but it's also they're, they're playing so that you don't change the channel. So they're not going to play anything new. They're not going to play anything that you haven't heard before. And again, it's all about debt service, how much money they owe, and the consolidation, as Casey mentioned it. Um, for another day, we can talk about yeah. <laughs> why radio sounds the way it does. It's really fascinating. Um, some radio people have given me that lecture. <laughs> we have a question. And tell us who you are. Sure. Uh, hi, gentlemen. Oh, this is quite on. Oh, there we go. Uh, thank you all for being here this morning. It's a really interesting conversation to listen to. My name is Krista McKinney. I'm an AU student in the Arts Management Program. And uh, I'm specifically interested in digital choral music publication. Um, and I know the digital music publication industry is kind of going through similar states of growth uh, right now with the copyright laws and all that stuff. So um, any expertise you can offer on that would be appreciated. But I also wanted to know, I feel like I've been listening to a lot of questions this morning. And so I'd be interested to know what each of your uh, visions of perfection would be in terms of where this ends up, where this discussion ends up. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I'll just jump in real fast because I like to hear myself talk clearly. <laughs> uh, pay for, if you use music commercially, let's all pay, agree that we have to pay for that use. Uh, another thing would be I don't really understand. Um, I can see both sides of the, the – um, 
the compulsory argument, whether, you know, on the efficiency side, the reason that this existed, compulsories existed or de facto compulsories existed because it would just be incredibly difficult to go around to every single rights holder and negotiate an individual use for, say, radio play. So I get that. On the other hand, uh, yeah, these rights are exclusive, we, but there are trade-offs, and we've made those trade-offs before in the law but, uh, for, for things like growing a marketplace, pursuing efficiency, and getting people paid regularly. So, uh, you know, I, I would like a universe where we can agree on one thing, first of all, and that is that, uh, you know, any commercial use of the music by a company that, that is making money off of that is paying for that use. And then we can have the secondary conversation about where these trade-offs are. I do think technology will solve some of the issues of, of uh, efficiency because if we have robust interactive databases that can talk to one another, then it's much easier to know who owns what piece of music and therefore easier to pay the people who own that music. On your choral music question, were you wondering about accessing choral arrangements or whether you have to pay for them? I, I, I'm not sure I understood the... Um, well, I think there's some copyright issues kind of right now with uh, the publication of choral music. Of sheet music. When it, when it comes to print publication, the publisher controls those rights exclusively, and it's their right to license the use of it uh, online or otherwise. If third parties are putting those choral arrangements online without the publisher's permission, those are infringing. It's sort of like lyrics. I mean, uh, people are grappling with a similar issue even in the pop marketplace and, and lyrics license and, and uh, the unlicensed ones versus the licensed ones. Um, to answer your question about you know vision for the perfect future, um, I, I, I think it's a good opportunity to talk about the, the shifting alliances and the shifting dynamics in this, in this industry. Um, the, uh, Casey's principles is a, is a terrific starting point, that if you're making commercial use of music, you should pay for it. Um, and, 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 and how do you get there? Well, um, you uh, enact a performance right that extends to uh, terrestrial radio so that over-the-air broadcasters are paying for the music that they use. You, um, you, you consider uh, federalizing pre-72 works so that webcasters and other services have an easy time um, identifying how they should get licensed for it. And that'll, that'll um, remove some of the, one of the major obstacles toward the flow of uh, the, the, the playing of music and the flow of royalties. Um, it, it, when, you, when you talk about, um, uh, and another aspect too is for services that I talk to, they all want one-stop shopping. And the statutory license is great for that. ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC are, are great for that on the musical work. But that's not, per that's not one-stop shopping perfectly. Even on, it w what they really want is basically they want to write one check, send it to one place, and be done with licensing. Um, that would be ideal for them. Um, that, the reason that is next to impossible is because of, of the different, the changing alliances. So, um, at Sound Exchange, we have a board of 18, as John knows, and nine artists, nine uh, representatives of the, of the copyright owners. And, and we have a hard time even deciding internally what our position is going to be on certain things. Um, pre-72, federalizing pre-72 would be great for us because that would increase the flow of royalties for, for tracks from, for, for example, Pandora and Sirius XM. Um, but the labels have their own interests in, in making sure that they, that those particular recordings are not under the, the scope of the statutory license because if it's not under the scope of the statutory license, then they get to require services to negotiate with them directly. Um, Meanwhile, um, re record labels and, and, and publishers don't necessarily have their interests uh, don't have their interests aligned align when it comes to um, paying on the reproduction right, and when it comes uh, to accounting um, uh, for the royalties that services on-demand services pay to uh, uh, to to the record labels. Um, the uh, and, and so. It, it's, it'll be very, very difficult to get to this one unified view of, of, of being able to pay simply, and and uh, and so those those are some of the, um, the 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 difficulties that come up. Back to the terrestrial exemption, um, you know, Pandora would love for a Performance Rights Act, um, and Sound Exchange would love for a Performance Rights Act. Um, the uh, uh, the publishers maybe not, because if 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 we're seeing royalties paid by over there broadcasters, does that cut into their, their perception of how big the pie is? Um, but Pandora 
in sound exchange. We're usually on opposite sides. When, we're always on opposite sides when it comes to rate settings. But this is one issue where our interests are clearly aligned. Um, you know, Pandora is, is working to increase its ad sales and increase its revenue. Um, it's an ad-supported product. Um, and the way that it does that is if advertisers and ad buying agencies recognize Pandora as being on equal footing with over-the-air radio, that they're both perceived as just being simply radio. Um, and, and, uh, and, and right now, Broadcasters are subsidized by the by the sound recording artists and copyright owners because the the broadcasters don't pay royalties for that for the content that they use, um, and that gives them a lower cost structure than what Pandora has to um, um, uh, work, work under. And as a result, that that impacts Pandora's ability to to be profitable and impacts Pandora's ability to sell ads at the same rate that that broadcasters do. Um, so if uh, if, if a terrestrial exemption um, were lifted and there was a performance rights act, then Pandora and and uh, um, would 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 be competing on equal footing with broadcasting, and the the, the royalties would be flowing uh, through Sound Exchange presumably, um, and, uh, and and the copyright owners and the uh, and the featured artists would 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 uh, benefit as a result. But it, the the dynamics shift from one issue to the other, and that makes it really difficult to get anything done. So, so John, can I? Uh, one question I was expecting, but we didn't hear. But, but given your sort of storied career and, and this experience in this industry, we've got some young law students with an interest in, in practicing in this field and entering it. And, and they understand it's challenging, and especially direct representation of artists. But, but could you talk a little bit about where you see the, the ways that a, you know, a young lawyer who's passionate about the arts wants to see the, the creative field flourish? How can they add value? Where where would you recommend they start, and, and what 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 can they bring to the table? What kind of skills and th things should they be working to develop so that they can actually find a career and in, in, in succeed? I think it's it's critical that you become as expert as you can be in copyright issues, in contract issues, um, that you learn the business because I think so much of being a practitioner in the entertainment. Uh, law area is actually understanding the deals, knowing who's getting how many pennies in every transaction. Um, and actually, you know, it used to be, uh, I, publishing in particular, used, you know, people would say, it's a business of pennies, now it's a business of micro pennies. Mm -hmm. And you really have to, under I mean, Pandora pays sound exchange 13 hundredths of a penny every time they stream a song. And that you put how many streams they had last year, they paid, what, probably $300 million or right. close to it to Sound Exchange. That's a lot of 13 hundredths of a penny when you think about it. So they're streaming billions of songs. Uh, so for a practitioner, the other thing I would say is don't do what I did, which was I said, I'm going to build an entertainment law practice in Washington, D.C., where there's really no entertainment business. Uh, I was very lucky because all of a sudden go go music exploded and I was representing a lot of go go bands. Um, and I got even more lucky when one of uh, my, I had a client I was representing who was managing Mary Chapin Carpenter and asked me to become his partner. And the next thing I know, you know, 10 million CDs and five Grammys. So, I mean, I got lucky. Go to New York, go to LA, go to Nashville, go to Miami where there are entertainment centers. Uh, you have a much better job of building practices there. Not only because. Um, there, you know, there's just more industry there, but there can be more artists there. If you really want to work with artists, that's where you're going to find a greater concentration of them. Um, and, you know, again, it, it's one of those businesses that's very mer mercurial. I had a friend in New York, you know, we would commiserate back in our early days. Um, and, you know, nobody, no firm was interested in him. And then he had this young singer, and all of a sudden she became Madonna. And every firm wanted him. So, you know, it only really takes one, you know, major client um, that can turn your career around. So it, it's very different. And again, I mean, you know, that's not the way I would tell you to do it. Um, you know, if you can clerk for a judge, if you can work at a big firm and get great training, uh, and then move laterally into a record company or a place like Sound Exchange, uh, there, you know, there are opportunities here. Typically in DC, the, the opportunities are going to be um, in trade associations or, or, you know, Sound Exchange is sort of a standalone here. Um, you know, a friend of mine was the general counsel at the Kennedy Center. I mean, there are jobs. You know, it's not like we don't have any. If you're interested in sports, you're a little bit, it's a little bit easier because every major city has major sports franchises and you can get involved in that area. But, you know, the music industry is very concentrated. It is harder. I do have, I mean, I'm of counsel to a firm where most of the lawyers in my firm are in Minneapolis. Um, and of course, Minneapolis had a big scene for a while. 
um, and they do a lot of work out of Chicago as well. I, we have a we have lawyer in New York, me in D.C., and most of the firm is in Minneapolis. But you can be outside of the four or five major music centers, but that's not the advice I'd give you if, if you know if you really want to build a career. But it's also you know you've really got to network. You've got to be incredibly passionate. If this isn't something that you live and breathe and you know are ready to struggle for, I mean I struggled five or six years before I made a living, and you've got to be prepared to do that in this field uh, unless you go to a big firm, get really great training, and then move laterally into a, a music corporation. And that's what the major labels want. They want you to be trained at a big company. And again, also between transactional lawyers and litigators, because mm -hmm. uh, again, very different skill sets. We need, trans we need litigators, especially in the copyright field. Um, you know, if, if you're litigating, um, you, you probably want to be on the record company side, because <laughs> they've got all the money. Um, and the artist can't afford you, you know. Uh, so, so it just, I guess that's where I'd put Well, can I just ask, what about um, representing the venues? We, we really haven't talked about the rise of live performance and the increase in the revenues. And, 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 and I did have a question. We, we have one of our organizers is very uh, uh, a big fan of electronic dance music and interested in festival liability type issues. So not straight up copyright issues, but uh, if, if your interest is more in the live, performance, uh, wh where are the opportunities there? What would you do? If, if you're interested in EDM, there's a great lawyer here in Georgetown named Karosh Nasseri, and um, Karosh represents a lot of major DJs and was one of the principal creators of the Miami, uh, you know, the Winter Music Conference um, in Miami, which is centered around EDM. He's fabulous, um, and he does take interns. Um, I sent him some from my business school program. Um, uh, at, at American. Um, that's the EDM. On the live side, um, you know, uh, I mean, my firm has represented a number of major venues here in town um, over the years, the 930 Club, um, the Birchmere. Um, you know, Live Nation obviously is going to have big firm representation that's going to handle all of their venues out of uh, New York and, and L.A., um, maybe a little in Nashville. But again, you know, that's another thing we've seen, which is, you know, the mom and pop venues, there's still a handful, you know, Jam and Java and places like that. But for the most part, all the venues have been rolled up, you know, by Live Nation, by AEG. Um, so, you know, representing venues is probably not going to be a huge practice area for most uh, independent practitioners. And Brad and Casey, other advice to young, enthusiastic lawyers who want to do stuff like what you're doing? Right. So um, uh, the, the irony is that when I was taking copyright law class uh, in, in law school, the, uh, there was a special on course, and we got to um, you know any any section above one one oh nine, and the professor said, "Hey, you never, don't worry about this. You're never gonna have to use it." And then, of course, now I just do one twelve and one fourteen. <laughs> um, and so those 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 sections at the back of the act that uh, are seem impenetrable actually uh, end up having real practical consequences. Um, I think that the uh, John's point about uh, learning the business and being an expert in that is is, is critical. Um, the uh, we in the legal department at Sound Exchange, we're not in in, in the um, you know we're not looking to hire a, a lawyer right now, but we do um, you know use uh, interns, and we and, and I'm noticing that the quality of the interns that, um, applications that we receive is just it, it, it's it's impressive, um, and everybody has done internships already um, or written a paper from a from a copyright class that touches on some topic that um, relates to, to, to music licensing um, and and so the, the it, it, John is right if you want to stand out you, you gotta you got to know um, some aspect of the business because your competitors for those jobs do as well um, one other thing I'd yeah. add um, I grade papers uh, for the Grammy organization you probably all watch the Grammy show or maybe you don't but the Grammys has an entertainment law initiative. It's a writing contest. Um, it's open to all law students. Um, and if you get a paper that you know gets graded well and you end up in the top five, come Grammy week, first of all, you get a free trip out to LA. You get a free ticket to the Grammys. You get a free ticket you know, to another event on the Friday night where they usually honor Paul McCartney or Bruce Springsteen or some major artist. And you're in the room. Everyone else is paying $2,500 a ticket. Mm -hmm. So. Great perks. You get a cash prize. But in addition, there's a, a luncheon. And you get to present your paper, a couple of minutes of it, in a room with 400 entertainment lawyers. 
And if you can't get a job after that, <laughs> something is wrong. <laughs> one, one of my favorite uh, uh, recent legal interns, or favorite in general, actually just wrote uh, for that opportunity on pre-72s, and I advised her on that. So and hopefully she wins uh, and gets a job and all that. Uh, I think we're, we're, we're missing one key segment of at least the Washington uh, music uh, uh, and, and law ecosystem, and that is the faceless bureaucracies. Uh, you can go into, you know, uh, into the intersection of policy policy and law at places like the Copyright Office, USPTO, and other federal agencies that are kind of intimately involved in this at the nuts and bolts level. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we have a question. Yeah, oh, I think he hit that one. Um, I think there's been a very interesting discussion, um, but I wanted to sort of get away from the radio-centric part of the discussion and possibly going to film. And I actually had two questions. So the first question is, um, there was reference to the phrase saying that, you know, at any time you make commercial use of music, one has to pay for it. So I wanted to delve a little bit more into what is the definition of commercial? And <laughs> if I could just get on a specific point. Um, every year, as you know, DC has its 48-hour film festival. You have all these filmmakers trundling off, and then they come up with um, a little movie. And most of them end up purchasing royalty-free pieces of music, which they pay, and then they have their contract. But when it comes to the actual screening of the film, you see, there is no commercial venture that the filmmaker has entered into. On the contrary, the filmmaker or the producer has actually lost out because they've paid an entry fee to get into the contest. But the film is screened free from the filmmaker's perspective. The only person actually making any money off of it is actually the people who run, Mark Ruppert, who actually runs the 48-hour film festival. So the question is, what is the definition of commercial? It shifts. I'll just jump in there real quick. I mean, for example, in the age of, of virality, you could have uh, something like, you know, I don't know, remember Chocolate Rain? That could be like the, it's like a, the, the example of user-generated expression that goes viral. But then there's commercial things that open up around it. Uh, first of all, like the, the platform that's hosting that is probably making money from selling ads and all the other things that they're doing on that site commercially. So it is very difficult to draw that line, and that line itself is in flux. Uh, I think that it, what we're talking about is if, if you are uh, part of our industry, uh, and we'll keep it like at the music industry just because it's easier, if you're part of our industries and uh, you are you have a consumer-facing product that uh, generates revenue for you, and a, hu and a certain chunk of that is derived from using music, you should pay. I mean, I think that's just a bedrock principle. Well, I think for filmmakers, um, I represent a number of documentary filmmakers typically doing music documentaries. Um, and, you know, it's kind of interesting. I've been on both sides of the fair use fence. Um, you know, when do filmmakers have to pay for what they use and, and when don't they? Um, and I think, you know, as a, there are times when, from a purely legal perspective, you might not have an obligation to pay. It right. might be a fair use. Mm -hmm. But f from a business perspective, um, you as a filmmaker may decide, I'm going to enter into a negotiation with the publisher, the music publisher, um, and if there's a master that you're using, if, if you're filming a live performance and you have a release from the band that's playing the song, you probably don't need to pay, get another license for that, but you know, for the composition you would need a license. Um, sometimes you might want to have that because if it then go, you need to sell DVDs or you, know, you want to do other commercial exploitations of your work, you are going to need to enter into negotiation with them. And going forward, you may have other times when you want to license things from them where you need a license. And if they feel that they've been, you know, um, slighted in the past, it's going to make it, that negotiation much more difficult. So I work with filmmakers very carefully on what we're going to claim fair use on, what we're going to pay for. Um, you know, with a, now I'm guessing there's no admission charge. Is there admission charge for these films? There is an admission charge. Um, now remember, there is no public performance right in theaters. Right. Um, the Alden Rochelle case, which is wrongly decided, but that's another <laughs> story um, for us to go down on another day. Um, but uh, so there's no public performance implication in terms of ASCAP and BMI. So it's really just you synchronize. There's a synchronization license right. you're supposed to get and a master use license when you're using a master recording 
uh, and uh, synchronizations. Like now, you said these were royalty free yeah, pieces so of music. What most filmmakers would do is you go to a particular website. Yeah. Um, and you'd pay. It's pre-cleared, basically. Pre-cleared, pre-cleared music. <laughs> you just pay for you know whatever little music that some independent artist has put together. And then it says though it can't be used for commercial purposes, right? No, it. You can't. You have all some rights. Of them are just open. Some of them literally. You could just well, then, just use then, that then you just use it and you're good. One, one last, last other interesting wrinkle. It doesn't address your question so much, but sometimes the industry will come to. It, it, through an agonizing process, uh, occasionally involving litigation, come to their own answers uh, without changing policy. Uh, an example of that would be cover songs on YouTube. You know, you know, there's tons of younger performers who are basically doing the popular songs of the day, and the publishers really want it to be cut into that revenue stream because, you know, for example, YouTube is is making money from serving ads on that. You even have kind of de facto modern YouTube-only label-type entities uh, that are exclusive channels to highlight some of that talent. Now, the publishers and uh, the platform came together to develop, a, I think, a novel license um, for for those uses. The tricky thing is the, the kids that are playing that, unless they're part of the little, uh, you know, uh, multi-channel distributor, I believe they're called, uh, unless they're part of the, the NCN or uh, MC, whatever it's called, unless they're part of it, they're probably not cut into the revenue stream. So you're, you're always going to have these tensions in trying to figure out who gets paid and under what conditions, but it's usually a positive when, when folks can realize that there is some inherent value and that that value can be uh, turned into a revenue stream. But you had another question. I had a second question. Let's say, for example, um, fair use means different things to different people. Oh, does it? <laughs> <laughs> and how? <laughs> so the question is, for example, if one were to, say, make a documentary, and you were using music of a particular artist for educational purposes, so there's no commercial venture involved at all, but you're using it to illustrate a particular point, for example, as a filmmaker, this particular piece enhances the suspense, this particular piece enhances drama, Technically, it's fair use, but is it something that's not actionable by an artist? Well, well l- let me say this. If it's prints that you're using, you'll get sued. But it's just, you know, I mean, he, he is probably the most um, protective of his rights. doesn't like it when people even do cover recordings. He tries to stop those even though he can't under Section 115. Um, you've described probably a situation where... I would argue that what you're doing is a fair use, depending on how much of the ori- original music you're using. I think if you're using very small pieces to illustrate a point about how this is, you know, this is putting forth the action, this is, you know, heightening the drama of a Say, story. doesn't Peter Yazzie of Washington College of Law have a filmmaker guy? He does guy have a guy, <laughs> yes. Are you aware of this? So there's a resource that I, it sounds like you need to get a, ha- a hold of. It's called the uh, Best Practices in Fair Use for Documentary Filmmakers, and it was produced uh, through a collaboration of my colleague, Peter Yazzie, and P- uh, Professor P- Patricia Afterheide of the School of Communication. And it, direct, it, it takes all of the common uh, situations in which a documentary filmmaker faces a, a clearance question and, and gives guidance about whether you can make a fair use judgment or not. Uh, in your example, it's not entirely clear that that would be a fair use. If all you're trying to do is enhance the dramatic effect, it's not clear that that use of the music doesn't need a license. Oh, no, no, no. I, I thought she said that she was using it as an example to show when music heightens oh, I see. Yes. Uh, In which case it would be. Yes, because then you're commenting on the music right, itself. Right. right. Um, but be careful because, uh, you know, uh, Professor Yazi and, uh, and Professor Afterheider's um, work um, probably isn't held in the highest of regard by content owners, um, <laughs> though I think it's a really valuable guide for filmmakers. Uh, on the other hand, you know, major motion picture studios rely on fair use constantly, and John can certainly uh, advise on the fact that this is a very flexible doctrine that's meant to, uh, you know, assist in, in, under certain very specific conditions, the creation of New York uh, new works without the burden of liability. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Great. Any other? Please. Good afternoon. Uh, My name is J.R. Russ. I'm also an alum of the Arts Management Program here. I also work at the D.C. Commission on the Arts and Humanities right now. I'm actually going to be managing a a fellowship program for local performers. And as you mentioned, while this isn't one of those centers, um, and there are a lot of people kind of doing it yourselves, would you recommend, because these artists probably can't afford uh, some of the services that current um, and future lawyers provide, that they, I don't know, take a law class? How much of this can they actually learn the business of themselves? You know, um, 
The DIY movement, one of the problems with it is that creators are really good at being creators, and they're not usually very good at being lawyers. Um, the, you know, for, for, start, for artists who are starting out, Washington Area Lawyers for the Arts is a great resource. I used to be a board member and did a lot of pro bono work for them. Um, and I recommend it for any artist. You know, I get a lot of calls from artists who can't afford me, and I just say, call them. Um, you'll get good advice. You'll get, and sometimes I refer people to the IP clinic here, actually, as well. Um, and um, so, I, you know, I think there are resources, and you know, they exist in pretty much every city. Um, you know, uh, I do um, a lecture um, for the artists in residence at Strathmore every year, where you know I just give them a, a basic how-to. And so, if you reach out. I'm sure through the law school or through you know other resources, people are happy to come in and do those kinds of lectures when you have a program like that. Hi, my question would be regarding uh, related to one shot uh, on a photo. I don't know. Um, I was very surprised and uh, just a little anecdote, but it worries me for other usage of photos. Um, Run marathons, so there is this photo company that shoots you during marathons with icons of course, monument, capital, whatever. And they sell you photos. They bought the basic package of three or four photos, hundred dollars, fine, addressed to me by mail, paid. Then I said, oh, I look cute here. Maybe I could use it as a go-to motor photo and produce. Christmas cards for my family. That's not, I'm not going to sell my photo because no one is interested in me. This is only for people I know, so that's not commercial. And the motor photo guy said, America is not the jungle, we have copyrights here, and refused. <laughs> then I went to another one who probably didn't know the copyrights, I don't know, I don't know who was right. <laughs> Fine, I produced my photos, I mean, I, Christmas cards. But I had a problem. Like, I, I'm an honest, I'm a lawyer, I'm an interesting person, I want to do the, the right way. What's the right way? I mean, anything else I want to produce. Where is your one shop? I paid $100 for four photos. Come on, I'm not cheap, I'm not cheating. Like, where are the rights? Who has the rights? Uh, well, on that one, um the photographer has the copyright. They, we, uh, although there's a nice article that questions <laughs> whether we should be giving cut, but the theory is that any work of authorship gets a copyright. So the photographer makes a choice about the positioning and the composition and the lighting and gets a copyright. And you purchased the right to the copies, but you probably didn't purchase a license to that copyright. And that's what the Moto Photo guy is saying is, just because you own a copy of a copyrighted work doesn't mean you own any rights in, in making reproductions. And, and without a license, they were nervous about doing that because they are a commercial operation. I, I think next time you run a marathon and they do that, when they send you the thing for the photo, say, I never signed a release. I didn't give you permission to take my photo. I'm suing you unless you give me the copyrights to my photo so I can make these Christmas cards. Yeah, your rights in your your rights in your image are are governed by state law rather than federal law, and it's only about half the states recognize a right. And but it's true that that would probably be a commercial use of the likeness, and so you would have a claim. <laughs> it's good. Ooh, I have a new class action. <laughs> Go, give it a shot. Um, so it seems like we're getting into a fair use discussion, so I just wanted to bring up the Google Books decision, how there's this fifth non-statutory factor now that the courts have looked into, which is just public policy. And I want your guys' opinion on how that would factor into the music industry and just we see so many public performances of sound recordings at festivals where DJs just have an agreement among themselves or just industry practice to allow for public performances. So how do you think this decision will, I guess, further this, I guess, fair use of sound recordings and how does that then relate to, you know, we have sampling and obviously there's no bright line. Mm -hmm. Do you think this public policy factor will weigh in favor of the samplers and the users of protected works by, I guess, advancing 
the public's access to works and just music as a whole and promoting the progress of arts. Well, interestingly, the Copyright Office was just asking that question like a week ago at a, at a uh, public um, <clears throat> stakeholder roundtable on, on orphan works and mass digitization. And it's frustrating to me, I, I was a participant, but it's frustrating to me that they're trying to force orphan works and mass mm -hmm. digitization into the same bucket because although there is overlap, there are issues that aren't necessarily, that are raised by each that aren't necessarily uh, meant to be harmonized, in my opinion. Uh, obviously, there's no de minimis for the sound recording. You hit on that with the sampling thing. So, you know, really it's about, I, John can tell me, uh, does iTunes require a license for uh, its its previews? You know, it's an interesting issue. It's pretty clear that there is no remember. fair use or de minimis use uh, exception, so they're, they're probably including that in their license with the record companies that they have so. the right to. Right. Now, they did have a, a, a battle with ASCAP and BMI because they were saying, well, that's a public performance the even when you, on a, pre, a preview. Oh, preview. On a preview. And, they, and I'm pretty sure they're licensed for that, that they had to pay for that, even though they didn't want to. Yeah, so I mean, you could maybe imagine a world where the president is interpreted so broadly that it include, could include portions of something to make available for you know, under a fair use premise, but I don't know that it's going to go there. Uh, I think that's what people were scared of in the in the Google case. But. What I think is interesting, um, and I think Professor Besick uh, at Columbia Law School, um, she testified before Congress a, a little while back, and the notion of transformative, um, it seems like the Google Book case has taken, the, and, and some other recent decisions have stretched it. I mean, transformative has always meant taking the original and transforming it into something new. Making a copy of it is not making something new. It's, it's transforming the purpose. Yeah. And is that completely turning fair use on its head by saying, you know, perfect 10? I mean, as long as you're doing thumbnails or something and you're not showing, I think it's, it's, it's an abuse. Of if you're interested in that, she, her testimony before uh, uh, Congress and the House Judiciary Subcommittee's ongoing <laughs> inquiry was really, really interesting. Um, and I, I got a lot out of it. It kind of changed the way I perceived some of this stuff. Yeah. So I thought that was very effective. You know, I, I do think one of the really interesting challenges of of girl talk, you know, and is, you know, no one has sued him. And I think they're worried about suing him because I think that truly is transformative. Um, and he's taking, you know, tiny little bits and pieces of everything and, and, and mi mixing it together. Sometimes uh, not so tiny, though. And, and we, don't want, we don't want to turn this into a discussion about sampling per se, but the frustration with the de minimis for some folks is it could be the hook. It could be the most important part of the song. Yeah. So right now, the, as part of the music licensing conversation, there's there's talk about a compulsory uh, sampling mechanism that would allow folks to more easily sample. I actually believe that you know uh, culture and society and the marketplace benefit from having new creations that can build on prior works. I think that you know De La Soul albums and Public Enemy albums are very viable and valid uh, forms of expression. And you know what? The, the Library of Congress agrees with me because they, uh, they made uh, It Takes a Nation of Millions by Public Enemy part of the historical record of sound recordings. Now, uh, again, it comes down to the thing like, you know, Dino Lepolt you know, says Stephen Tyler that. can't, you know, Stephen Tyler sings Dream On. That's the most important part, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> right, but no, my, my point though is that I think for, on the master side, you know, it, I mean, it'll be a very interesting challenge for sound exchange. So will every underlying composite, a, a sound recording get, you know, one thirtieth of the whole royalty? And then obviously the same thing for BMI, ASCAP, and CSAC. Are they going to have to parse through and go, you know, because uh, Greg Geller didn't create any of those. I mean, he created the whole, but... Multiple songwriters, particularly on the publishing side. I mean, yeah, boy, that gets just be, Yeah, it's going to be... <laughs> A mess, and I know Sound Exchange. As I was leaving in 2010, was starting to get, you know, people who were sampling sound recordings saying, "Pay 20 percent of my master rights to this other company, because I used, you know, a sample of, of that recording significantly." Yeah. Um, I just was at an academic conference where there was someone proposing a seven-second compulsory license, and I said, "That's pretty long." <laughs> yeah, that, well, I said, okay, think about satisfaction, you know, the guitar hook. How long does that take? Less than seven seconds. You know, the opening to Beethoven's Fifth, of course, way in the public domain now, but much quicker than seven seconds. So I think that, you know, qualitatively, quantitatively, you know, I don't know how you do it. Two thoughts on that. Um, one is how Sound Exchange handles the, uh, the, the, um, 
the sampling issue. Um, it's, not, it, it, it's, 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 a, it's a it's a jumping off point for talking about the compulsory license and how it is a self-reporting regime where the services that use the statutory license they report to us what they've played and then they pay based on that usage. Uh, we do audit, um, but that you know there's too many services to audit every single year, um, and so it is an honor system. Um, and and so the data that we get from these services is. That's the starting point in how we distribute the royalties. So if somebody says, like you mentioned, hey, um, if, if service says, hey, I played this particular track, and these are the, the um, and, and, and if Girl Talk is the is the um, uh, the performing artist, then the money would go to Girl Talk. Um, and and if, and if Girl Talk has told Sound Exchange ahead of time, hey, X percent goes you know this way, and, and X, the Y percent that way, then we'll handle it accordingly. Um, but it's it, it, it the. But, but services don't necessarily report consistently. They consistently, they don't report consistently. Um, the data is really, really bad in in uh, in, in the in the in the in the music industry. Um, and anybody who can crack the metadata problem is going to mm -hmm. really um, sh uh, show their worth to to the industry. Um, so that that's a, a challenge that we face right now. Uh, I got a question for Casey actually about the um, um, the. Uh, the compulsory license. Um, it, th this is something that I, I'm fascinated by, um, and you mentioned that you would prefer to um, uh, promote the, the growth and the building of one art form upon the other. On one hand, um, um, and and would a compulsory license allow that? Because the it, it seems to me, I want your take on this. Um, it seems to balance the interest and in be able to, in be able to build upon somebody else's work, while at the same time uh, um, paying the, the the original um, creator um, some. Yeah. You know, fair amount for for that work, um, because the the creator loses that right to exclude. Yeah, that's the tricky thing because some uses are just going to be so you know kind of objectionable, de facto objectionable. I mean, you don't want necessarily even the smallest amount of your you don't want your snare hit used on a KKK rally video or something like that, right? There's like the right to say no is an important part. I could envision maybe a, a compulsory or at least an option, a, a suite of options that would allow uh, yes, the right to decline that use, but also easier ways to license. Uh, smaller uses. I don't know how you would make that uh, differentiation between a time-based use and a hook. Like, you know, in some instances, like the baseline to Steely Dan's peg is just as important, even if you use that much of it in a hip-hop song as whatever. So I don't have the answers there. I do think that uh, one of the most interesting things, though, is that when when people are flying under the radar. Mixtapes, major record labels use them as promotion and turn a blind eye. Uh, or in the case of Girl Talk, nobody's getting paid for that. Even Greg Gillis, aka Girl Talk, is not getting paid for that because he doesn't want to uh, be liable for damages. <laughs> so he's very kind of like sneakily giving the product away and it gets enormously popular. Everybody listens to it. Nobody litigates and nobody gets paid. That to me doesn't seem like the best, most efficient uh, marketplace for sampling. How we crack the riddle, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that have come up with some pretty interesting um, proposals for that. I don't know that I would feel um, uh, strongly or, or it would be willing to endorse any one of them at this point. I mean, we, we did a, we literally, our organization, not me, but like Peter DeCola from our organization who was our research director and is a longtime board member and uh, uh, his uh, co-author, Ken Brew McLeod, who's at the University of Michigan, wrote a book called Creative License. And it's one of the best books on sampling because it actually shows you not just how the industry perceives sampling, but how the creators do. You know, somebody like Clyde uh, Stubblefield who drums for James Brown, he only wants attribution because he's just so, like, everybody has used Funky Drummer as a break on pretty much every record ever, but nobody has ever said, hey, that guy did that. He played that. And then there's other people, of course, for whom one note is just impermissible and will always be impermissible. It's a really hard riddle to crack. <laughs> I should point out he's no longer drumming for James Brown. Right. Um, <laughs> but, he, he, you know, it's just... But um, the most sampled drummer of all time. Uh, you, you know, but I think that, you know, every... So year that I teach music publishing and copyright to my undergrads, um, I challenge them to create, and they get into groups and we have discussion groups trying to create the compulsory license for sampling. And n they have not done one yet that I have found acceptable. And I just yeah. think, you know, it's, it's hard. It's really, really hard. And, and you know. On the other hand, there's some people like that we know in Washington, because we, we are on panels with them, we bump into them. You know, we know who they are. I'm not going to name names, but they're, they, they will say things like, you know, they're, that the hip hop sampling market is working perfectly. Well, I don't know that I believe that like there's a greater value to, you know, 
P. Diddy talking over Kashmir as there is to De La Soul three feet high and rising. I, I truly believe that one is a, is a very intricate, uh, multi-layered uh, f- set of like expression around a pre-existing idiom, largely jazz, and the other is just a guy talking over the rift of Kashmir. And I, and, but yet the marketplace right now is so slanted that the only people that can afford to participate are the ones that talk over Kashmir to a large extent. And yes, those people are making a ton of money, but there's this huge middle ground where nothing is licensed or people aren't making money. Uh, a lot of this can be solved through technology. You might not probably need to go all the way to, to the federal statute. You might be able to create clearing houses, better me- metadata, better own ownership information, facilitating a range of transactions where people have options, that could be a solution, uh, but that also requires a lot of uh, dedicated effort. I think one of the interesting things you brought up, Kimberly McLeod's book, they also did a documentary, Copyright Criminals. Um, Kimberly did, yeah. Yeah, Kimber. Um, and one of the things that's really interesting is they contacted a fellow named Michael Kloster, who represents Public Enemies Publishing, and asked him for permission to use the songs in the film. And Michael Kloster said, well, I can't give you permission because there's all these samples in it and, you know, I'll, I'll, I, I'd be in trouble. So, no, you can't use them. And, he, and so they said, well, we're using them anyway. It's fair use. So I just thought that was a great little anecdote um, about Public Enemy in the movie. And one thing about fair use is, um, so in my own view, I think there's more space for fair use in the sampling market than I'm hearing. Although I think if you're going to do a license, it, you'd have to have some kind of royalty stacking provision, right? Yeah. Because that's, sure. I, I think what what's pretty well documented is there was this moment in the sort of 80s, early 90s hip hop when, you know, it was like treating found art, and, but but the samples were often manipulated, and so the amount of the sort of original artistic value that you were taking, and I think that's the hard part is, well, I think we would all agree that when the sample performs the function of grabbing some of the artistic value from the original recording, then you, you put, you've got to pay because uh, you're relying on but that. the publishing side, there's precedent, uh, pretty established all the way up to the, you know, the, the Beastie Boys use of that flute sample on the underlying composition side that does allow for that type of quoting. And you can find that type of quoting going all the way back to classical compositions, right? It's only on the sound copyright side post Bridgeport that everyone is afraid yeah. to, like, you know, test the fair. Bridgeport was just the most wrongly reasoned case in copyright law from my perspective. But um, uh, yet fair use was not used as an available defense, so we'll never know. The judge went ahead and put his bright line down anyway. But <laughs> well, he had to reissue the opinion because even the RIAA had to file an amicus brief saying, excuse me, but de minimis is only one doctrine, fair use still has to exist, and they, they issued the opinion to say, yeah, well, fair use, but not in this case. It's wild. <laughs> um, are there any other thoughts or questions? Or going to let these busy gentlemen get back to their busy Washington lives? <laughs> Rather stay here, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> A little oasis. If you want to stay here, then I'll ask some more questions. Um, but we do want to save some time for, I guess, whoever's remaining to come and and meet you. Um, But I know you mentioned Columbia Law School, and I know that Maria Payante is the Register of Copyrights. She's spoken there a couple times about, I guess, since 2012 and revamping the Copyright Act. Um, And she's given the same speech over and over again to various law schools and universities and even testifying to Congress. Um, And she she drops a footnote in the speech on Section 114. It's really the only mention in the 40-page speech about Section 114, and she just basically says how convoluted and confusing it is and that there should probably be some change to it. So I know we talked about the definition of interactive service. I'm bringing back the streaming, but what would you all propose? I guess Brad would probably have a, uh, a, a, a more of a stake in the, in the opinion, but what would you propose as a change to Section 114 to make it, I guess, more accessible to market entrants just so they can have an understanding, not have to seek outside counsel? to figure out how do they cla- how is their service classified, how to make it consistent with the definition of interactive service, because the first one, as you mentioned, looks more like non-interactive than interactive, the specially created definition. So I guess what would you propose, because it seems like I think market competition is a good thing, mm-hmm. and every other day there's a new service. You said there's 2,000 now. How, how, do, we, how do we streamline this, this statute to make it more accessible to market entrants? Yeah. Um, at, at the outset, I'd, I'd point out that it's not a bad thing to have to refer to outside counsel. That's that's good for our <laughs> careers. <laughs> um, but uh, I think the um, it's always helpful to know the the, the backstory behind 
um, any particular statute. And there are a lot of provisions in, in 114. And they all have, they're all grounded in, in, in pretty good reasons. Um, and if you want to understand 114 um, fundamentally, it's, it, it is that these restrictions in 114 are designed so that this, this license is only available to radio-like services. Um, and, and that is designed, that's there so that, um, that these services do not cannibalize um, sales. Um, the, uh, right now, I think user preference um, is creating a market that is going toward um, interactive services. Um, we, we want the ability to hear um, uh, whatever it is at a particular point in time, to an extent. Um, still, m music is one thing where it's, it, it serves a purpose in the background. It's something that we listen to as we multitask, and, and, and that's a, that, those are situations where a lean back, a radio-like experience is still um, valued by the marketplace. Um, the, uh, for services that are looking to use the, the statutory license, um, these, these questions of how to design an, a non-interactive service are, are, are vexing. Um, I, I spend a lot of time on the phone with services saying, you know, I can't give you legal advice, but this is how other people do it. Um, and, and, uh, and so you, you, there's, there's an argument to be made for, for, for cleaning up that, the definition of interactivity. Um, but uh, sitting here right now, I, it, 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 it serves a good purpose the way, the way that it's written. Um, there are other rules within the statute, such as the archiving provisions and the sound recording performance complement that um, limit the, uh, the number of tracks that you can play to three from a particular album and four from a particular artist within a three-hour period. Um, I don't know if that's representative of what's needed now. Um, you know, and, and that does create um, uh, my understanding anecdotally is that those particular rules um, create some real important design uh, consequences for webcasting services. Yeah. If I could jump in, yeah. the performance complement that Brad just referenced um, is something that needs to go away. Mm -hmm. it, at the time the statute was written, um, people in their uh, Pollyanna-ish uh, you know, um, theory, I guess, thought, oh, well, we're, people are going to tape webcasting. And you know, use that for their for copying, and and, and it'll be substitutional. Um, we don't, and, and I there's a certain level that I agree. You don't want a, a service to have the all Madonna channel, the all Springsteen channel, the all Girl Talk channel, you know, and on and on and on, because there's unlimited bandwidth. You could just tune into that channel. You you would never download anything. You would never buy anything. Um, and we still do have about a three billion dollar a year purchase industry, um, but. When they wrote, you can't play more than three songs in a three-hour period, or you know, two in a row, three in a row from a box set. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a pretty interesting group of things. What they weren't thinking about, because of course the lobbyists for the recording industry were thinking, big stars, popular music. You can't play an entire symphony mm -hmm. legally mm -hmm. because it's got more than three movements, and you can't play all four of them because each one's a separate track. Uh, and Sound Exchange had this dilemma, which was we don't want to call it one work because we want to get paid for each individual mm -hmm. movement. Otherwise, you have long songs. We don't get a long song rate like they do under Section 115. So there was a lot of stuff going on. I, you need to get rid of it, but you do need to have no all artist channels, one artist channels. Um, th th there's a better way to do it. I I've actually counseled some management groups. Um, it's interesting. Pandora, I'm not sure, really cares about getting rid of the performance complement because their whole business is based on the idea that if you put in this artist, we'll play you a bunch of artists that you like right. like them. Right. So they actually want you to discover new artists. It's what differentiates them from everyone else. I actually went to Pandora and said to them on behalf of a major management company, hey, if you were to play six songs every three hours, we'd double this artist's money. And this was an artist making six figures at Sound Exchange, so it was, it was worth a lot of money. And, and they were saying, well, we're not sure we want to do that. So, uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting, uh, I, I would get a lot of grief, obviously from NPR with their classical stations about the issue. Um, mm -hmm. And the other people that were very upset about it were Sirius XM. You have DJs there who do want to be able to, you know, craft a, an all artist kind of a set or something like that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they have the artist in the studio. If the artist is in the studio, you just get them to sign a waiver. That's easy. You know, I, 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 that I thought was just, you know, bogus. But mm -hmm. they do, you know, they did complain about um, those uh, playlist restrictions. Clearly, there should be some sort of waivers on a blanket basis. If an artist dies, you can do a one hour tribute. Mm -hmm. If, you know, if it's a, 50, it's a milestone year or something like that, 50th anniversary, 40th anniversary of Sgt. Pepper, whatever mm -hmm. it might be. 
Um, so I think there's things that need to be fixed in that particular uh, provision, but, but that's not going to change the complexity of the rest of the statute, which is incredible. Yeah. The performance complement is really, really interesting. You guys hit on every single one of those issues. The other thing about 114 I don't think we've brought up is that the limitations there that, you know, they kind of um, shape what is permissible in the non-interactive marketplace uh, it can affect rate setting as well. For example, how do, you, um, how do you set rates when there's no comparable market? If this one market is just non-interactive, what are you comparing that to, uh, particularly on the master use side? You're not comparing it to the radio market because they don't pay anything. So basically they're doing an arcane calculation, removing the, 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 the value of the s subscribers, as I understand it, on interactive and using that to, to inform determinations. You could tell me more about that. Yeah, so I mean, that, the, the, Casey's absolutely right. Historically, um, there, you know, interactive services just used the statutory license and did not enter into direct license uh, negotiations. And the reason for that um, uh, should be clear. When, when it's a compulsory license, the copyright owner doesn't have the right to say no. And that means that the rates generally um, would be lower than what you would, you would uh, achieve in an open market. Um, and so for service, um, uh, choosing between a direct negotiation that would lead to presumably higher rates or pressing the easy button and just using the statutory license at presumably lower rates, it's a no-brainer. Um, th th things have changed slightly, and that is with the advent of iTunes Radio from Apple. Um, iTunes Radio uh, thinks of itself as as a service that would otherwise be eligible for the statutory license. Um, it has uh, um, it, not all the major labels share that view, but um, it thinks of itself as being eligible for the statutory license. The reason that that Apple went to um, went to the the labels to um, uh, get direct licenses is one it has huge leverage in negotiation because of its iTunes store. And also the rates are set up in such a way that Apple's really two, uh, only two choices were to pay on a per performance rate at the rack rate, at, the, at the, um, the default rate set by the judges, or alternatively to use what are called the pure play rates, which are roughly a 50 percent uh, discount on, on the default rates but require at least 25 percent of gross revenue, and it's a, it's a greater yeah, up formula. Um, and and I, I would love for Apple to give us 25 percent of that. <laughs> <all revenue. laughs> well, I think there's another reason. There's one other reason. This allows them to compete against Pandora overseas because Pandora, because of the complexities of, yes. the, of the PRO universe overseas that we were talking about before the panel, uh, means a, a, I think Pandora is what, in New Zealand and America, basically? No, Australia. In Australia? Yeah. Okay. So uh, Apple, because it has relationships with these multinational major labels in every single territory because of the iTunes uh, download store was effectively able to turn on iTunes radio because it obtained direct licenses around the world. Uh, so I think that might have been a strategic. Yeah, that's right. The, 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 the foreign reach or the foreign, the, the lack of a foreign reach um, under the statutory license um, is obvious because of the uh, territorial uh, limitations of copyright in the United States. Um, that is a huge problem um, in the marketplace for digital services. Everybody would like to be streaming to as many people as possible around the world, and for them to be licensed in foreign countries, there's not a statutory license in other countries that makes it easy. Um, and so that, that's a, a real problem. Um, we, we've, we've thought internally about how we might be able to address that problem with setting up some sort of reciprocal arrangement um, with um, so societies in other countries, but that's, that's complicated as well. Um, in terms of uh, 114 changes, um, one thing that I would bring up um, that uh, uh, doesn't necessarily uh, implicate the services, um, but it, 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 I think it's critically important, and it goes to Casey's point of parity, is that um, the three services that were in, in existence before 1998 um, have their rates set at a different standard than what the rest of the services have their rates set. Um, the rest of the services have their rates set under what's called a willing buyer, willing seller standard, which uh, you know is, is a way of uh, attempting to recreate this this um, this uh, the, an open marketplace. Um, the uh, the three services, Muzak, Music Choice, and, and, and SiriusXM, benefit from a lower uh, uh, or a different rate standard that inevitably leads to lower rates, and that's the 801B standard that um, tells the judges, hey, look at the marketplace evidence, but then take into account these policy implications, and these four policy implications tend to drive um, drive the rates down. Um, it might have. It, this is also the standard that's that's used in, in 115, and it's why that legislation attempts to change that as well and create a, a uniform standard under um, each of the compulsory licenses. Um, but these policy factors um, tend to create um, a subsidy for um, for Sirius XM in particular, and a company that size doesn't need a subsidy from artists and labels. Yeah. All right. So with that, I think we need to thank our panelists. And <laughs>